side projects. Whether absolutely necessary or just driven by the compulsion to do things the right way, one thing is certain, they never run out. Along my journey, I've shared many of the side projects that I've gotten sucked into. But you'd be surprised how many I end up kicking down the road just to help me stay somewhat on task. There are some side projects, however, that I will simply kick no more. I've been using the mill for several months now, and there are a few minor inconveniences that have really been picking away at my patience. So I'm dedicating an entire video to just side projects on the mill. And hopefully by the end of this video I'll have a more functional and enjoyable machine. Welcome to the first ever side project extravaganza. Beyond just the machines, my grandfather's shop included many machine tool accessories. To my surprise, many of these were never used, and from what I can tell, some weren't even opened. Included in these tools are three mill accessories that I've been itching to put to use. A pneumatic drawbar impact for quickly changing tools. A quill micrometer for easy tool depth tracking. And lastly, the one I'm most excited for, a power feed drive for the Z-axis. Before I dive into these though, I should really spend a little time cleaning up this whole area. Yeah, I know, I know, don't judge me. Let's go ahead and get that counter on the screen. I can already feel a new record coming. I'll start up on the mill itself so I don't have to sweep twice. Things aren't too bad up high, but the lower I go, the messier things get. I'm really glad this mill has these way covers that keep the majority of the mess off the ground surfaces. Cleaning the whey oil reservoir actually reminds me of something else I've been putting off. One of the oil lines out of this T-fitting actually has a small crack in it that slowly leaks oil all over the top of this reservoir. It's about time I fix this. I ordered this replacement 4mm line back when I made some similar repairs to the surface grinder. I've got enough here to replace all of these old brittle lines, so I'll go ahead and do them all at once. There are three lines to replace. The one that was damaged goes to this distribution block that branches out to the ways and lead screws of the table and saddle. Another line goes to the left side of the z-axis way. And the last line passes through the casting to the right side of the z-axis way. Which of course can only be accessed by laying on the ground. Maybe I should have finished sweeping before starting on something else. Alright, with all three lines connected I can refill the reservoir and give it a few pumps. Problem solved. I better finish cleaning up before something else catches my attention. Actually, these airlines laying on the ground make sweeping a real pain. I've kind of been wanting to put these up high for a while, so guess what? No need for anything fancy here, just some zip ties to attach the hoses to the electrical conduit. And while I'm at it, I'll do the same for the hose behind the lathe. That looks a lot better. And now I can really get at these areas with the broom. I should have guessed there was a decent amount of metal chips here considering I couldn't even see the concrete anymore. But it didn't really hit me until it was all in one pile. If I had to guess, this is probably close to 30 pounds of metal. It's super satisfying to actually see this floor clean again after all these months. But of course I can't just let the rest of the floor stay a mess now. If I don't sweep the rest of the shop, by the end of the day the mill area will be a mess again. That takes care of the floor, but the mill has a tendency to throw chips everywhere, including in these storage bins right next to the mill. I could clean these out, but I could also do something even better. I managed to snag a few of these cabinets from a surplus auction at my job, and I've been hanging on to them until the need arose. This one has been sitting in a barn for a while, so it needs a little TLC before moving it into the shop. These bins have been holding fluids, grinding accessories, miscellaneous drills, taps, dies, extra hand tools, and basically anything else I didn't have a spot for. I have an idea for these bins, so I won't take them out of the shop just yet.
The cabinet, once in place, needs a quick leveling job to ensure the doors close evenly. Then I can start loading everything back in. Except for one issue. I'm not super confident in the strength of these shelves. You can even see where something heavy bowed some of them in their past life. I'm going to have to fix this first. These shelves are weakest along the long edges. So a couple of strategically placed pieces of wood on each shelf should help a lot. I'll attach these along the front and back edges with some lath screws. That actually worked pretty well. I mean I wouldn't do pull-ups off of them or anything, but it'll hold the contents just fine. What this cabinet lacks in its number of shelves, it makes up for in its depth. So just about everything I took out of the bins goes right back in here. Now I said I had an idea for the bins. As it stands, all of my material stock is packed away in totes and boxes under this metal table. Which not only looks janky, but is super inconvenient when I have to go digging for something. So I'm going to use the bins for my material storage. Yeah, I know this could probably wait, but this is a day for side projects. Might as well do some other side projects while we're doing the main side projects. First I have to clear the whole area to make room for the bins. I don't want anything that could potentially create more mess in front of the bin, so I'll move the table over where the belt grinder was. All this big stock can stay off to the side, and I can put the shelf of bins right against the wall. I kind of like the idea of having a designated grinding bench, so I'll remove the belt grinder from its current pedestal and mount it to the table. Then I'll also mount the bench grinder I use for shaping tools of this table as well. It's a little tight, but I'll give it a try for a while to see how I like the arrangement. Before I go loading these bins up, I'll vacuum out all the chips. Then begin the process of organizing the different metals into some sort of logical order into the bins. In general, I'm keeping the different aluminums, steels, and brasses, and so on in their own rows. This will be so much easier to get to and to see what I actually have. Plus there will be plenty of room to slowly expand into. Now you may be wondering, what about the drill press? It's time I fill you in on a little secret I've been keeping. I actually inherited two from my grandfather. Since I no longer have the table space for the little one, I'll find a new home for it and bring in the big floor mounted jet. There isn't really anywhere I can put this beast, so I have to play the shuffle game once again. I'll swap the grinder for the drill press, swap the hydraulic press for the grinder, and then put the hydraulic press in front of the metal bins. This isn't ideal, but I can still reasonably get to the bins, and this press won't make any mess that could end up in the cavities. With that little side quest out of the way, I can finally get back to the mill projects. Well, sort of. I've been using this mill at this angled position for a while now, and I'm pretty happy with it. Only problem is it's resting on its casters, so it has a tendency to dance about when I'm using it. Since I've got the floor all cleaned up, this is as good a time as any to get it up on its support feet so it stops moving around on me. And while I'm at it, I might as well get it somewhat level. The jack bolts on the caster frame aren't quite long enough to reach the ground, so I'm making up the difference with these dense oak blocks. Next I'll make some room at the center of the table for the level. And then methodically begin making adjustments until I'm level in both directions. This part really takes patience since the slightest of adjustments can make a big difference on the level. The wood blocks might compress a little bit over time, but it's not really an issue for me since I don't really need this machine dead level. Now if you've made it this far, I have to thank you for enduring my distractible tendencies. Let's dig into the real side projects we came here for. First I'll start with the drawbar impact. This was actually mounted to the mill when I moved it here, and for whatever reason I decided not to reinstall it when I cleaned out the mill the first time. Don't ask me why. Regardless, this should be pretty easy to install. The main unit simply mounts with three screws to the head of the mill. Then we just have to get some air to it. I commandeered the original airport for another line, so I'll have to come up with something else. Let's see what I have in the old fitting bins. I think I can make something work with this T, barbs, and quick connect coupling. First I'll need to swap the air impact line for a quick connect plug. And use a crimp clamp on the barb so it doesn't pop off there once under pressure. Then thread everything together with Teflon tape to prevent it from leaking. I need to splice these fittings into the line somewhere, but it only just now occurred to me that I don't have a shutoff valve anywhere on the line. So I'm using this vice grip to pinch the line closed temporarily. Then I can make a cut and insert the T using the barbs. These barbs are a special push lock type that don't require clamps, which is awesome, but they're a real bear to get in place. Alright, let's turn the air back on and see how it works. Yep, 
Yeah, I don't know why I removed this in the first place. That is so much faster. The next upgrade to install is the quill micrometer. I found this when I was packing everything up for the big move to my shop and didn't realize what it was at the time, hence the uncertain name on the box. But opening it now, I realize this thing is pretty freaking nice. Not only is it a Mitutoyo brand scale, but it's completely unused. And it looks like all the hardware is compatible for a Bridgeport style mill like my own. Hopefully this will be a pretty easy install. The first step is to remove the old scale and mount the spacer block. But the slot spacing on the spacer block doesn't quite match up with the holes already in the scale. So much for easy. Looks like I'm going to have to modify this a bit. I basically just need to extend the slots an eighth of an inch in each direction. There's a lot of adjustability built into the mounting hardware, so locating the part by eye should be plenty good enough. The slots have counterbore features, so I'll extend these first. Then switch to a smaller end mill for the through slot. That should be plenty of clearance now, so let's see how it fits. Perfect, now we can go ahead and attach the scale bracket as well. The reed head of the scale gets its own bracket to allow it to travel with the position of the quill. Except of course it's not that easy. The diameter of this stub is a bit too large to fit into the quill stop. Luckily I know a guy with a lathe who can fix this real quick. The difference in diameter is only about 15 thou, so I'll take this all off in one pass. Then we can put this all back together and see how it fits. That will do nicely. The top and bottom ends of the scale attach to the bracket we mounted earlier. But as luck would have it, we've run into yet another issue. The slots in the mounting bracket don't give enough travel to properly align with the scale. So all of this has to come back off for what is hopefully the last modification. Luckily this is another pretty simple job. There are a couple different things I could do to fix this, but I'm choosing to just drill and tap a couple new holes in the spacer block. This will effectively extend the range of the slot in the mounting bracket. Let's install this one last time. This go around I'll attach the scale to the bracket ahead of time. Then when we attach the bracket, we can move the quill through its travel to ensure proper alignment before tightening the mounting screws. The only thing left to do now is to put the battery in and give it a try. What are the chances that this original battery from 1999 will still work? Well, color me surprised. And I even get four decimal places. Sweet. Out of curiosity, I really want to see how accurate this thing is. I've got a dial indicator attached to the quill and zeroed on the top of a 3 inch gauge block. Now if I zero the micrometer, remove the gauge block, and then drop the quill exactly 3 inches, my dial indicator should read zero on the table face. And lo and behold it does. This is a really nice addition to this machine, and I'm pretty excited for the functionality it will add. But not nearly as excited as I am for this next upgrade. Anyone who's used a manual knee mill knows that the most labor intensive part of the machine is cranking the z-axis hand wheel. It can take nearly a minute just to go from the bottom to the top. And you might even break a sweat doing it. Lucky for me I found this power feed unit amongst all the stuff I inherited. It comes with what looks like the hardware for mounting to the z-axis and is also an Enco brand like the mill itself. So I'm optimistic that this will be a pretty easy install. I know I said that last time, but still. Step one is to get the current crank assembly off the mill. We won't talk about how long it took me to figure out how to get this all apart. In my defense though, it was on there pretty tight. The assembly came with this special bearing flange that includes mounting holes for the motor unit. It's supposed to be a replacement for the existing bearing flange, but as you can see, they're pretty different. I can't really see anything wrong with drilling and tapping holes in the existing bearing flange, so that's exactly what I'm going to do. First I'll attach the extension shaft that came with the kit to properly center and level the drive unit. This allows me to use transfer punches to mark the locations of the two holes I need to drill. I'll fill this opening with a paper towel just to prevent the metal chips from getting in the bearing, and then drill and tap these holes right in place. Now I can reinstall the extension shaft and mount the drive unit. The bevel gear goes on next, but it's not quite as simple as just putting it on. It has to have the proper engagement with the bevel gear coming out of the drive unit. And that's what these shims are for. These need to be installed one by one until the minimum amount of backlash is felt in the gear train while not jamming the gears. 
Once the appropriate shims are determined, I can install the key and slide the bevel gear on for good. And then slide the dial on. Except something is amiss here as well. The dial bore is quite a bit larger than the hub on the bevel gear. Didn't see that one coming. I guess I'll have to schmooze my buddy with the lathe again to make me a filler ring. Since this ring needs to be a running fit, it seems appropriate that I make it from a piece of bronze like this. First I'll bore out a section with the largest drill I have, and then switch to a boring bar to take it the rest of the way. But something seems fishy. It looks like there's oil coming out of this material, and this finish really looks like trash. This is probably a self-lubricating bushing that I mistook for some plain old bronze. Well that's just silly. Fortunately that one only took a few minutes to make, so I'll just start over, this time using steel. This is probably a better idea anyway, since brass on bronze might have galled and seized up. With the ring parted off, I'll press it into the dial bore using a disc of aluminum to keep it straight. Let's see how it fits. Excellent. This gets the shim treatment as well, and then the locking ring is threaded in place. Which of course doesn't lock anything. Why am I not surprised? The problem is that the ring runs into the hub shoulder before engaging on the dial, but this is a simple enough fix on the lathe. Recessing the inside of the ring should allow it to engage fully with the dial. Just like that. Let's get the rest of this assembled and test it out. Moment of truth. Hey, it works! The speed adjustment is pretty nice, and the rapid traverse is way faster than I could crank this by hand. Just what I was hoping for. Hang on a second. You've got to be kidding me, man. For some reason, this thing won't go down. The lever seems to be engaging pretty solidly, so maybe it's just a limit switch. Nope, nothing seems out of place here. I guess we'll have to go ahead and take this apart and see what's going on inside. If I'm being honest, this scratches the part of my brain that wants to take absolutely everything apart to see how it works. So I don't mind the inconvenience as much. Yep, that's pretty cool. It looks like through a series of mechanisms there are two limit switches that are triggered by the lever. But the switch for going down isn't being engaged quite enough. So I'll see if I can work the switch up on its mount a little bit to get it fully engaged. Hey, that worked. That was a lot easier than I was expecting. Let's get this all together and try it once again. Now that's more like it. And the limit switch seems to be doing its job as well. Speaking of the limit switch, I'm going to have to mount this somewhere. The kit came with this extruded aluminum rail with adjustable end bumpers for triggering the switch. It needs to go somewhere where the column and knee slide by each other. This side of the mill should do just fine. First I need to mount the switch itself. And it just so happens that this block was made up specifically for this purpose. It spaces the switch out just enough for the step in the casting. Next is the rail that holds the limit switch triggers. The point of the switches is to stop the power feed before it crashes the table into something. So I'll lower the z-axis as far as it will go and use this as my starting point. I'll drill and tap a hole right in the column for mounting the lower end of the rail. Then I can bring the knee up and use the highest position to locate the top mounting hole. But because the casting of the column has a slight taper to it, the top trigger doesn't engage with the switch. Looks like I'm going to have to whip up a spacer block real quick. It only needs to bolster the rail out about a half inch, and I just so happen to have some half inch scrap laying around. First I'll make a through hole for the mounting screw. Then cut this to length on the bandsaw and grind a slight chamfer on each of the edges. Now I can drill and tap a mounting hole and bolt this thing down for good. One last and final thing before I can call this project complete is to tidy up all the loose cables. Everybody loves a little cable management. Alright, I think that just about does it for this batch of side projects. Though it is funny how three simple side projects can expand so rapidly. And I was right. I set a new record. On the bright side, that's 21 projects I don't have to do later. Plus my mill is now outfitted with probably the three most useful upgrades possible. And it's properly poised to make another giant mess. As always, thanks for watching, and see you next time. <laughs>